work it, make it, do it, make sense. Hello, uh, this is Introduction to Kotlin by Example. My name is Dmitry. I'm a software developer. I've been working with Java and JVM languages the last 10 years, so, so um, mostly for banks. I'm not affiliated with JetBrains, so I can say whatever I want. And I assume uh, everything I show is downloadable from this Dropbox link, so you don't need to write it down. If you want to take a photo, it's already there. You can download it now and see what's coming. So I assume everyone in this room know what Java is, and of course the answer, it is an island. And so zooming in onto the island, it's quite big, and as a joke, there is Java C. <laughs> there are kind of nice photos from there, so n not all of it is so nice, but there are nice places obviously on Java, or something like this. So similarly, you can guess what Kotlin is, and the answer, it is an island. And zooming in again, it's an island, way, way smaller, an island under St. Petersburg. So it looks something like this. I've never been there, but it's much easier to get there, I think, than like, from, at least from London. So in reality, Kotlin is a programming language. It's statically typed, pragmatic, and it currently compiles into JVM and JavaScript. So it's officially supported, released support for JavaScript. So statically typed should be obvious what it means. Pragmatic, it means that it wasn't built with any experimental feature, so it was designed to be interoperable with Java, embeddable in existing code bases, and like used in production. Uh, as, as I mentioned, it currently compiles to JVM and JavaScript platforms, and the, the, there is experimental Kotlin native. So it is open source. Apache 2 license, it's on GitHub. You can contribute to it, but in reality, it's JetBrains uh, employees who develop it. Uh, this is a graph showing history of commits for Kotlin projects. So I downloaded, cloned it from GitHub, ran some analysis on it. So vertical line is amount of commits per month for Kotlin, and horizontal line is time. So it starts in 2011, so even though it seems like a new language, it actually existed for six years before release one was published. And this is unlike JavaScript, which allegedly was designed in two weeks. It took like six years for Kotlin to get it right. Then they broke backwards compatibility, keeping only the features which are useful, and the, which they were confident are useful. And then they released version one from which the they support backward compatibility. So this was last year. This year it was Kotlin 1.1 release. So overall it's about 20, 30 people working on it. So it's, it's not a huge project. I mean, in terms of it's not massive amount of developers. But this might be a good thing, though. So obvious question, why not Java? So like, to be fair, if you like, love Java and you have no problems with it, then definitely use Java. But other than that, it's just Java is a bit old and it's difficult to change. My favorite example is semicolons. Uh, I think at last Java 1, there was a question to Java architects. Are there any plans to make semicolons optional in Java? And the answer was, like, technically it's doable, but in practice we have so many things to do other than semicolons. So in reality, it's not going to happen ever. So we stuck with semicolons in Java forever. It's like a trivial example. There are other things which are difficult to change. So why not Scala is because arguably Scala went too far and it's now too complex already. It's, it's kind of fine when you do a simple project, but when it's like 100 people working for 10 years and then you look at what they've done and there is no single person who really understands the whole application, then it can be really complex working with languages like Scala. So this is like the, the biggest arguments against Scala. And for, why not Groovy? The problem with Groovy is that it's dynamically typed. It has optional types, but they're not very strict. So again, on huge projects, it's probably not so good. And wh why would you use Kotlin? There are certain things which do not exist in Kotlin, or uh, do not exist in other languages, for example, nullable types, and I'll show it later. So this was like quick introduction. Now, now I'm going to do demo like with live coding. So here will be some examples. It will be Flowbuild, Factorial, and CodeCutter. And the reason I'm doing examples instead of slides because I think it shows um, just to show how it actually works, like actual workflow on your daily basis rather than just some code. Hopefully, uh, it all will make sense. 
if you want me to, like, if you have a question, just give a shout. If you want me to type some code uh, to see how it works, also just, just interrupt. So here we have, this is IntelliJ in presentation mode. And this is Hello World, so if I run it now, it will print Hello World. So here the syntax fun is keyword in Kotlin, which means uh, this is a function declaration. Then we have function name, takes arguments, and after column, you have type of the argument, and this is the return type of the function. This is unit, which is like void in Java, so, and it is optional. Then in curly braces, we have the body. It says println. This is a string literal, as you might expect. If I go to println, navigate to it, this is just, it's, it's a function defined in Kotlin as the library. Like over here, you can see path. And it's just system out Java. So I can here extract, for example, this word as a message. And here you see this is string interpolation. The Java syntax is this with pluses. In Kotlin, you can do it in a shorter way. And this is like the full syntax with curly braces. So here, as you can see, val is keyword. And it's like th this is the name of the variable. And there is no type. This is because in Kotlin, there is local type inference. So this, we can specify type explicitly, and it is a string. If I navigate to string, it is Kotlin string, which is slightly funny. But the interesting bit is that at runtime, it becomes Java length string. So now I'm looking at Kotlin bytecode. And you can see in definition of main method, it becomes Java length string. This is one of the reasons why Kotlin can be compiled to different environments. So at compile time, this is Kotlin.string. This is not Java string. But after it's compiled, it becomes, for Java platform, it will be Java length string. For JavaScript, it will be something else. So this is like why it works. So here you can remove string. And if we try to assign something to the message, like DevOps, we get a red thing which says, well, cannot be reassigned. And we can't change it to var. So uh, by default, everything should be val. It's like final immutable. This is equivalent to Java final. And you can change it to var. So I'll change it back and change it to val. Now I can, I'll, I'll try and extract a function called greeting. So you can see that this is, again, function definition. It takes one argument message and then returns another string. But it looks slightly different. This is expression body. So if, you, if all your function is just one expression, it can be converted to this form. So I can convert it to similar format as main, and it will look like this. Then you have to have return keyword. Unlike scaling Groovy, last expression is not returned automatically from functions. So here I can try again similar thing with message and do devox. And again, it complains, can it be reassigned? If we try to do var, we cannot do it. So all parameters are final and might change in future, but right now you just cannot reassign anything. One of the interesting features which, is, which doesn't exist in Scala and Groovy, you can have extension methods. So here I'm doing this, uh, doing this refactoring, convert parameter to receiver. And it changes method signature. Now it's stream.greeting. And here we have this instead of message. So, and when we use it, we can pretend there is a method greeting on the stream. So I hope that this makes sense. If you want. In reality, how it works is just a static method. So if we look at bytecode, this is just a public final static. It takes a stream. And so in a way, it's like in Python, you pass this as the first argument to methods. So this is a similar thing. We, we can also define uh, our own methods, like println, and it will do println this. Right. Then we can rewrite our hello world like this. And it still works fine. So I'll change this bit back to argument. Receive a parameter message. And another thing we, we can do is we can have default arguments for default values for parameters. So here, then, we don't need message anymore. Another thing, which is just a nice thing, we can have ni named parameters. So here, I, I, the message means 
this argument is basically named, so and I inlaid hello world, right? With functions, they can be private, which is like normal thing. They can be internal, which is like C sharp convention, so they won't be accessible from other modules. They can be protected, but there is no package private. And by default, everything is public. This was a slightly controversial decision, because originally in Kotlin, it was the other way out. Everything is defa by default was private, and you had to be specific to make it public. But then it was deliberate design decision that because most Java code bases have more public fields than private, so they decided to save characters and swapped it the other way around. So also functions can be defined anywhere, so I can put it inside main. And as you can notice, there is no surrounding class around it, so I, I can just type code in the file. There is also a good, because uh, for programmatic language, it was designed for interoperation with Java within the same project, so I have some class written hello function, greeting from Java, I can do println. So if I navigate to greeting from Java, you see this is Java code because there is semicolon. So, and it all prints now, so it interoperates with Java. Yeah, so I've been running it through IDE and it's like interesting to know how it's all configured. It's all very similar to Scala or Groovy, so this particular project, there is POM XML, if I expand it, but the configuration is relatively simple. All you need is this dependency for this project, and then there is a plugin for Maven to actually compile. Then IntelliJ can pick it up, or you can compile it from command line and so on. So this is how it all actually works. So this is, this is it with Hello World. And switch to slides. This was Hello World. This is what we looked at, basic syntax, string abstraction over platform valve versus unnamed parameters, extension functions, and Java. This was like really intense hello world, so here is a joke. The, the question is what was first, chicken or egg, and the answer from evolutionary point of view that egg was first with some lizards with the ancestors before chicken. So, so the, the next example, this was kind of about strings, the next example is factorial which is about numbers, as you might guess. Uh, factorial, I'm sure everyone here knows what factorial is, so basically this is Wikipedia page, this five ban and then equals all the numbers from five to one multiplied. So I'm switching back to ID and here is factorial. So this is similar, we have entry point, main, main function, and inside there we have defined factorial, so it works, good. And it's defined in a recursive way, so if n less than 1, then we return 1. Otherwise, we calculate factorial for n minus 1 multiplied by n. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of cleanup here, so I'll move function outside of main. Uh, also, if statement is an expression, so I can do this thing, like lift return out of if, so here. Instead of return inside if, I, I moved return to here, and it, it all works. There is another thing we could do instead of if is to use when. This is like switch statement in Java almost, but a bit more powerful. And see here, it's like if n minus one, then return one, else return factorial. But I don't like it here. I think I'll keep it like this and put it into one line. So because it's 2017, we should really write a unit test. So I'll do class factorial tests. This is interesting argument that probably all frameworks and everyone is wrong, and files should be called tests, like plural, because usually inside those classes you have multiple tests. Why you call it one test? That, that's an interesting argument. So this, this syntax looks like almost like Java, and here we say calculate factorial. And I'll move all this into test. and I can run it. So essentially, we're now using test framework as the main method for now, at least. So what, what's going on here is that I define a class, looks exactly like Java. Then we have test annotation. As you can see from inputs, this test annotation is just JUnit, really. And then, again, we define function. But then we have backticks, this is special syntax where you can avoid uh, restrictions for what you can have in identifier. So it's similar to Scala and Groovy. You can have almost anything there, including reserved keywords. And then we have like test. 
And it all works because it compiles to normal Java code, so it integrates with IDEO, all the tools. Like, you don't need to do anything special. So now we need some assertions. So I can say assert that equal to, let's say, 1 for now. And then there is a question what we want to import. And there is hamcrest with K, which is written for Kotlin, but I'll go with just normal Java hamcrest. And these are equals to. So now if I run this, it should like, fail because numbers are not correct. I think these are the right numbers. So yeah, it fails. Then I have like, 20. So now it will work. As you can see, this is just normal Java method. So quite often, you can just use Java libraries, and they work seamlessly. So here, th this is, all looks good, but if we, what if we try Factorial 17 as an evil example? And it returns negative number, which is a bit strange because it definitely should be negative for multiplying positive numbers. And th the answer to it, if we navigate to int and go to Kotlin, this is Kotlin source code, it says represents the two-bit signed integer, and on JVM, it's basically lowercase int. And as, as you can expect, uh, it will just silently overflow. If you look at bytecode, you're pretty sure you can guess what's going on. This is bytecode factorial, it's just normal int. So at runtime, this is Kotlin int, and after, as compile time, this Kotlin int, at runtime, it becomes lowercase int. Also, all these methods, they're really not special syntax, this is operator overloading. So this compared to less than equals is compared to on int objects in Kotlin. The same with minus, the same with multiply. You can control click on them and see what's going on. So we could try and do like lon right here, but it's not going to really help. It will overflow slightly later. So the actual answer is to go for a big decimal, for example. So this is what I'm going to do. It will take a little bit of effort. So like import move to one. Then we need to change all the whole test. So w one thing to note, so th this is normal Java math big decimal, as you can see from inputs. The interesting thing, this is big decimal constructor, and we don't have new keyword. I think it's one of the interesting features, and I think it's a good feature, like no new keyword, because why would you need keyword? Your constructor is like constructs the value of your type, and that, that, that's all there is to it. So if I run it now, it should print a more sensible number rather than negative. So yeah, we have an answer, good, and paste it back in. Um, as you noticed, I changed all the um, literals to big decimal constant, and it would be nice to do something like that. And actually, you can do it with extension functions. It's like quite easy to define. So I can do something like that. So if I remove private and then do this dot compare to big integer, big decimal n. So basically, we're just wrapping n into big decimal, and so th this works now. It's pretty good. The, the, notice the keyword operator. If I remove it, it stops working. So we can do the same thing here, create extension function on big decimal. So it's the same. Again, this is shortened syntax for expression body, and it's big decimal. And so it works fine as well. So what, what we can do. We, you can always use like the actual method call, so you can dot, dot minus one, and this will look just like Java. There is one more thing we could try and do one, but then the, you could do it in Scala with implicit conversions. There is nothing like this in Kotlin, so you, we could do like two big decimal and so on, but this is t too much. It's like it's not going to add a lot of value, so there is no way to do to have this syntax. So this is all good, but. The next obvious step is like, what if it was big decimal of oops, 30,000? Right. You can guess where it's going. Uh, sorry, not big decimal, should be factorial. Uh, factorial of 30,000, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can guess what's going to happen. And this is like favorite stack overflow error. So the problem is that this factorial is recursive, and when it's big numbers, it's bigger than default stack size in Java. 
So obviously, we need to write an iterative way or do tail call optimization. And Kotlin can do it. Like Scala, there is tail rec annotation. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't happen by default. You have to be explicit about it. And ID will hint if you correct, because here the problem is that it's not really tail recursive uh, implementation, the one we have, because the last operation is multiplication. So we, we need to rewrite, rewrite, uh, rewrite it to be tail recursive. So something like this probably will do. I do results. And here, do factorial n minus 1, result multiplied by n. So now this should work. And you see the warning is gone. And we get this tiny, tiny number. Just kind of scroll right. For that. Looks correct to me. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is factorial example. So this is what we looked at in Sloan abstraction. Again, similar. Although big decimal wasn't part of this abstraction. Big decimal was in Java. So all numbers and object, no new keyword. There is operator overloading. You can do tail call optimization. And we looked at unit testing. So and that's a joke. That unless you're in space, your glass is always full. It's super optimist. So the next example is code cutter. So, and it's data mining cutter, which is a bit more realistic, enterprisey thing. So, I learned about code cutters from a website by Dave Thomas, who wrote, co authored this book, Pragmatic Programmer. This is what website looks like right now. It used to look more seriously in the past. I'm not sure <laughs> why it changed to cats. But in general, cutter is a small exercise you do again and again to improve your skills. For example, coding skills comes from martial arts where they repeat movement and practice repeating the same movement over and over again. So one of the cutters on this website, cutter number four, about data mining. So the cutter is, has three parts. Part one is that you read text file and you look, you process it and find day with minimum temperature space. The file contains a table, and in table you have day number and maximum and minimum temperature on that day. Then you do in part two similar thing with football teams. You find team with minimum goal difference. And in part three, you refactor it. So I won't do all of it, but I'll do just the beginning. So switch. You can do data munching cutter. So what we have here is class definition with tests, again, plural. It, th this is syntax for extending a class. So this is string spec. Here I'm showing a uh, different testing framework, which is not JUnit-based, more Kotlin test. So what, what, what's going on here? So we extend the class string spec, and here we have init as a keyword, and this is the code which will be run after instantiation of this class. If we go to string spec, we see it extends test base, this is run with, so it all just integrates with JUnit infrastructure because it has this JUnit annotation in super class. Then there is some interesting things, interesting things that are happening here, so we have string and then curly braces, like slightly strange syntax, so I'll show what's going on in reality. So this is actually lambda. If we specify type, this is how we specify it. lambda from unit to unit, so it's like void to void in Java, and this is the actual lambda. Then we do, uh, this is invoke method on string, and this is uh, extension method, which is defined in superclass string spec, so if I control click on it, this is how it works, so it's defined in here, and because it's operator, it can be converted to just parents. And there is another rule, which is similar to Groovy, if you pass a lambda as the last argument to function, then you can drop parents, so you can end up with curly braces. So given all that, it looks like we just call in something on a string, and you could do it with any other class, so it's kind of interesting that those simple things, they accumulate and you can have interesting like syntax and so on. So I'll run it and show the actual file now. So what's going on here is you can guess, we're printing all the lines from this file with weather. So this is what it looks like, uh, this is some stuff at the top, I have no idea what this is really. Then we finally get to some data, and it's the end a little bit more rubbish. 
So it looks like typical enterprise problem. So I'll show what's going on here. So file is Java IO file, so it's constructed here. Then read lines is extension method defined in Kotlin IO, which just returns the list of streams. And then for reach is, again, extension method, which is defined on iterable. It takes a lambda, and similar to what I showed, this is just we uh, drop in parents and using curly braces. And here inside the closure, what we have uh, specify, yeah. So inside lambda, we print in uh, line, and it is the default name for single argument. So this is the full syntax, but because there is only one argument to the lambda, it's called it, like in Groovy. So this is what's going on. Now, as you might notice, this read lines doesn't throw any exceptions. We know, don't have any ex catch exception things anywhere. This is because there are no checked exception in Kotlin. It's all, uh, they're all unchecked. So to show, to explain a little bit more what's going on, so if I extract lines and specify type, as you can see, this is list of strings, this is how you uh, do type parameters. So you can guess by now that string is probably, if I control click and it's defined in Kotlin collections, and at runtime it will become Java util string. So if I click on stream and I go into Kotlin source code, Kotlin collections, I can collapse everything. So you can see it's like mirrors Java collections, really. So list extends collections. By the way, you can see this is declaration site variants. So unlike Java or Scala, Kotlin can do both. You can define your variants in when you use the, some collection or when you declare them. So it's, it's more flexible. And you can see list extends collection and so on, but you might notice there is mutable list. So the trick is that by default, Kotlin list is read-only, where read-only means you cannot modify it, but it doesn't mean that it's persistent data structure underneath it. But anyway, so this is like list is read-only, and there is similar thing for sets and maps and so on. So by default, all, all, everything is read-only. Here is a slide with diagram. So green are read-only Kotlin collections, yellowish mutable, and uh, at the bottom you see blue, this is Java util, like normal collections in Java. So I'll inline this thing and move on with the code cutter, really. So what we want is probably, again, looking at the file, we probably want to drop the top and take just 30 lines. This is what I'm going to do, so I remember how many to drop. So we want to drop, take 30. These are extension methods, drop and take. So now we got rid of rubbish. Then what we might want to do is do map and split regex. So what we're doing is mapping each line and splitting using this regex. Unlike Java and Scala, if you want regex, you have to have explicitly regex object. If you put in a string, it, won't, it will treat it as a string. It won't magically compile it into regex. And arguably, this is a good design because it's very explicit that this string won't be magically transformed somewhere in the background. So if I run this again, it, we should see that each line now becomes a list. So it looks like a list because there are commas between numbers. And now we probably want to extract three columns like day maximum temperature and minimum temperature. So I'll do it as a list for now. So I'll put it like this, it's two, it's three. So what's going on here, I'm creating a list. This is just like as list in Java, similar thing. And here, what's going on again, operator overloading. So we had a list and then we extract uh, values from the list. So if I run it again, we should just have three columns. Yeah, so uh, it's going on what, what's expected. Then we want to convert the last two columns into integer to do difference. So this, again, extension method, if I click on it, it's just Java length parsing, but looks nicer. If I run it again, it will probably fail because there are some numbers they have stars. And as a typical enterprise developer, I'll just do replace it with something like remove those. I don't know what they mean. I'll just remove them. So now it looks better. 
the, almost what we want. The interesting thing, there are no tuples in Kotlin, but they used to be there. And before the first release, they, the, the, they decided to remove tuples because it wasn't clear how it's going to play with the rest of the language. So they decided to be conservative and maybe add tuples later. And the, the, one of the solutions instead of tuple was to use data classes. So it is similar to case classes in Scala. So here I'm typing weather entry class. So this class which has annotation data. So you might expect from Scala, it will have equals hash code to string and so on and copy methods. So it will have day, which is string, val max, which is int, and val mean, which is also int. So now I can use weather entry instead of list, and it will be nicer. It's also arguably more semantically rich than just tuples, which have one, two, three. So, so now you can see it prints weather entry because it has to string. And the last bit is to what we needed to do is to find min day with minimum temperature spread. So you can say max minus it min, and then do should print a land. Can I do it? No. Okay. I'll just do variable here, entry, and do print a line. And the answer should be day 14, yeah. Unfortunately, it's not 42, not enough entries. So now we can write, um, because it's a test, we should probably write assertion. So I can basically almost copy the output here. And now it should be. So yeah, test pass, good. Arguably here, what we were going to do is to assert on the day, and we're asserting on the whole entry. So it should probably be something like that in reality. But here we bump into the next problem is that compiler is not happy, it says, this is like something's going on here. And to understand it's, it's useful to see the actual type of this entry. And this type is almost like entry, but it has question mark. So this is how in Kotlin you get nullable, not nullable types. Uh, by default, everything, every type is not null. So whether entry cannot be null. But if you want it to be null, you have to add question mark at, at the end. The reason it happens is that mean by method it can return null if your collection is empty, so, and it enforces entry to be null. So if I remove question mark, we get red arrow around mean by. So it has to be nullable. So th there are a few workarounds you can get from ID. So you can surround with null check. Here, uh, Kotlin is clever enough to understand that entry is final. If we check it for null, then on the next line, it's definitely not null, so we don't need to do anything. It's like one way, it's called smart casting, and it can be used for some other things as well. So the next fix is to add bang bang, which is basically say, I know what I'm doing. This is not going to be null. If it's null, it will be null point at runtime. And probably the, the right thing to do in this case is probably say with safe, we're going to do question mark dot, which means if entry is null, the whole expression is null. There is a nice blog post by NetPrice about type hierarchy and nullable things. So that's, that's the blog post. You can quickly skim it. So it says with, like, at the top of class hierarchy, there is a class called any, which is like object in Java. So then we can scroll down. So it's basically the whole inheritance model. It's like in Java when you have multiple inheritance from interfaces and single inheritance from classes. Then there are nullable types, which is for all the types you define, you get like a mirror of nullable types. And not nullable types, like any, without question mark, they are subtypes of nullable. So you have this mi mirroring of the whole hierarchy. Then there is unit, as we've seen, there is only value of one. There is only one value of unit. And there is nothing at the bottom of the hierarchy. And that's it. It's so like pretty neat type system in a way. There are some slightly strange things like nullable nothing, which cannot exist, but it's nullable. It's strange. But anyway, that, that's the hierarchy. So th this is like almost the part one of the cutter. I'll do a bit of cheating and just paste part two, just to show what it's like. So you can this is very similar code. So we get football file, read lines, drop few lines, filter it then split it and create team entry. And here we like a bit nicer formatting when we specify names. 
for like using named parameters. And then again, we mean by football team, and then we print it. So the, if we were to do third part of the cutter, we will have to probably introduce some abstraction, and the simplest attempt would be to say this is super type data class entry with some val key of any, for example, and then try to extend it. And we will s soon find that we cannot extend because it might, we cannot extend because this is final class. This is another interesting thing in Kotlin. All classes by default are final, so you have to mark them open. As soon as we do open, we figure out that data is incompatible, so we cannot have data class and open at the same time. If we remove data, then it's just a class which doesn't do much, so there is no real point. And for me, it's like it should be an interface, really. And we can do something like that and then implement it. And implement the interface. So this is the way I would go. Please. But I'm, I'm going to stop here and mo move on. So this was code cut. Uh, this is what we looked at at collections, lambdas, higher order functions is those, those functions like for each we looked at. And no checked exception data classes, nullable types, and we looked at yet another testing framework, Kotlin test. So this is how you do SQL injection for road cameras. Um, now, Kotlin puzzlers. They're not like real, real puzzlers, but obviously they're inspired by Java puzzlers. If you haven't read this book, it's definitely recommended, great book. And what, what I showed, like those puzzles, obviously, if you just saw, uh, just learned a little bit about language, it's not fair to have puzzles. So these are introductory puzzles, like things you can bump in when you start using Kotlin and get confused. So the first thing, hello, hello. Going back to hello world, so we have two main functions. The first one, main one, it does println hello one, and main two, which does println hello two. So like we just looked, this was expression body syntax, and on the main two, it's like Scala syntax. So w w my understanding is like it should print hello one and hello two. Right? So what are the answers? So I, I go for B, because it's going to be hello one and two. Uh, you, you, do you have your favorite guess ready? And the answer is one. It doesn't print two. And the answer, the, the reason for it is that main two, if you specify full syntax, it just returns a lambda. It doesn't really do anything. So here, return type is a lambda, so it's not unit. Moving on is similar thing, what am I? So here we have main method, value called what am I, then curly braces parens, and then we print this value. My reason is that I don't know, curly braces, it looks like I, I learned from like these examples, the curly brace is probably a lambda. So but it has nothing inside. So I don't know, it's probably shouldn't be a valid thing to do. And so my, my guess would be that it shouldn't really compile. I'm not sure. Or return something like null. So if you look at the answers like null, unit, empty string doesn't compile. So I go for D. I don't think it should compile. So I hope you have your guess. And the answer is Kotlin unit. This is because if we extract, show, show all the types explicitly, uh, the curly braces is, is, is a lambda which returns a unit, and what am I evaluates to unit, and the source code for unit is this. This actual source code for unit, it returns to string, and this is the only object, so this is how it works. Uh, th this is my favorite one, return the turn of power throw. So here we have f1 and f2, two functions. The first function does return return 42, the second throw throw exception. So because everything is expression in Kotlin, I would think like return 42 it makes sense. It's expression. It has type of fiends probably. And then we return in, so it's all fine. Throw throw is like definitely compilation error. So what are the answers? So I choose b. So it returns 42, and the second function doesn't compile. And the answer is, it all works fine. And the reason for it is that there is type nothing, which is at the bottom of the hierarchy. And in reality, the type of expression return 42 is not int from type system return type is nothing, 
which is subtype of int. So from compiler point of view, the leftmost return returns nothing, which is subtype of int, which is fine. At runtime is what happens. The rightmost return is evaluated, and that's it. It's the end of execution. Similar thing with throw exception. So you can throw any object, which is subtype of expression, and nothing is subtype of expression, so it's all fine. And for example, if you look, there is a method in Kotlin called to do. It has type nothing, and it throws an exception. This is this is why it works. It allows you to do fun things like this. This valid code runs fine. You have back ticks, you can use keywords in there, and then you just return twice. Or even this, return, throw, throw, return, valid. So a bit more complicated example with defaulted map values. So I used Ruby and Scala previously. So here we have number n, like it's var, notice it can be changed. And then we have map, empty map of anything. And then we do dot with default and pass in a closure which increments n. And then we try and get from empty map some value. And what I expect is like Groovy and Scala developer that with default will wrap my map into another map which will provide default value when the key is missing. So what's going on here, my, my reasoning, like map, missing key, it will evaluate the n++. So it will return 42, but it will increment 10. Second time we run it, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Will it like remember the key was 42, or will it evaluate it again? So because it's closure, maybe it evaluates us all the time. So it will be, my guess, 42, 43. And the value of n will be 44 in the end, but still. So I'm going for b. And it sounds like a reasonable thing. There are other options like 42, 42, or like nulls, or throw null pointer. So the fun thing is that it's just nulls. And the reason for it, as we've seen before, this square brackets, it's operator overloading, it's get. So it's normal get on the map, it's just like in Java. Then the fun thing is that with the, this is normal get. The fun thing is what with default is doing, and it traps map into this interface, which doesn't have get, it doesn't override get at all, so it's doing something completely different related to another language feature. So this is why you get nulls. Like you wrapped map, and but your get still returns null. So this is just uh, there was a bug, and the fix actually is just to write code like this. Don't use dot with default ever. So that's that's how you do. That's how you get the same functionality. You get you use method get or default instead. So the the final puzzler is like 99 bottles. So here we have package backticks 99. So we, as we have seen with uh, function names, you can use backticks to do anything, right? To, in any other context, you can use backticks. Then we define class bottles, and we create an instance of it and assign to value bottles. And then we print class of this value. So my guess would be is that it should print 99 dot bottles or something like that. Like well, why not if it's a valid thing? So these are the answers. So I guess maybe D might be reasonable because it's underscore. Maybe all these numerals are not allowed on Java, but I think fundamentally you can use anything, right? Probably, I don't know. So pick your guess, and the answer is it doesn't compile. And in reality, your compiler crashes. So you can say none of the above. And this is not fair for puzzlers. I know it's like breaking rules of puzzlers. And this like actual error. But the point of this is Kotlin is relatively new, and there are those edge cases which you are more likely to find than, let's say, in a language like Java. So nothing, uh, it's not perfect yet. So, but it, it's, it's getting there. So in reality, it's, it would work. For example, this code will work if you move class and value inside main function. Uh, and you can define classes anywhere. So this will work, and it will print something. It won't crash. So yeah. This the end, and like finally, in the end, some links to Kotlin. So where you can find things about Kotlin, there is a website kotlin.link, which has lots of links to libraries and frameworks and so on. There is obviously there is Kotlin Lang like website with Kotlin. You can go there and find lots of things. There are Kotlin Cohen's like small exercises, where you have a failing test, you write some. Kotlin code makes the test pass, and you can do it even without any installation in the browser if you Google for it for Kotlin Cohen's. Kotlin Cohen's also like on GitHub if you want to clone it and run locally. 
I did 99 problems in Kotlin. There is this website, 99 problems in Scala, which was originally 99 problems in Prolog. So I did all of them in Kotlin. So if you're brave enough, the beginning is very easy of this Kotlin, uh, of 99 problems. It begins very easy, then it suddenly becomes very complex. So if you can persist, that's the thing. There is obviously a Twitter account which you can follow. There is a blog. The interesting thing about blog is that it's been maintained for all six years. If you want to see the history of the language, like go read the blog. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And there is Kotlin Action Book, you can see on, on this blog. Uh, there is also forums online, discusskotlinlang.org. And there is um, a Slack channel. And it's, it's, it's quite nice. There are developers, like Kotlin core developers there. They can help you usually very quickly. Like within a day, you will get some answers. So it's like a very nice place to be. And that's, that's the Kotlin future. There will be 1x releases. Currently, I think the biggest problem with Kotlin is that version 1.1, there are performance problems. And there are no fundamental reasons for it. Because it, unlike Scala, it was designed to work at least compile just as fast as Java. But there are currently problems. So if you download the latest version of something and something is slow, just don't think it's because Kotlin is slow in general. So it will be fixed, I hope, soon-ish. So this is what's coming in future lists also will be, I think, literals for lists. And yeah. The other thing which I didn't mention, but it's already released in, in production on both JVM and JavaScript platforms, is core routine support. And the interesting thing is that unlike other languages, the abstraction was pushed down so you can do like yield from loops and it yield is it like in C sharp. It's library function, it's not a keyword. So take a look at this. This is interesting. And there is Kotlin native, which is just in preview stage. So it's very early days for Kotlin native, but it's in development, so it will be, it, it's already possible, but it, it, in the future you could be able to, you will be able to compile Kotlin code into native code and just use it. So that's it, and please give some feedback over there. Thank you.